Story seventeen of the best British short stories of nineteen twenty two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The best British short stories of nineteen twenty two by various. Story seventeen Genius by Eleanor Mordaunt from Hutchinson's Magazine and The Century Magazine, 1921 1922. Part 1. I have written before of Ben Cohen with his eternal pouring and humming over the scores of great masters, of the timber yard at Canning Town, forever changing and forever the same, devouring forests with the eternal wind like rush of saws, slide of gigantic plains, practical and chill, wrapped in river fogs, and yet exotic with the dust of cedar, camphor, paragoric. In those days Ben Cohen was wont to read music as other boys read their penny dreadfuls, avidly, with the imagined sounds like great waves forever a rush through his soul. In the very beginning it was any music just music. Then for a while Wagner held him. Any Wagnerian concert, any mixed entertainment which included Wagner, it seemed as though he sniffed them upon the breeze, and he would tramp for miles, wait for hours, biting cold, sleet, snow, mud, rain, all alike disregarded by that persistence which the very poor must bring to the pursuit of pleasure, the capture of cheap seats. Once ensconced, regardless of hard, narrow seats, heights, crowds, his passion of adoration and excitement took him, shook him, tore him so that it was wonder his frail body did not split in two, render up the soul coming forth as Lazarus from the sepulchre. It was indeed, if you knew little Ben Cohen, him, himself, difficult to realize that his body had anything more to do with him than the yellow drab waterproof which is a sort of uniform a species of charity covering a multitude of sins of poverty shabbiness threadbareness had to do with the real jenny bligh and yet ben cohen's body was more completely his than one might have imagined jenny could and indeed did slough off her disguise on sundays or rare summer days but ben and that self which was apart from music that wildly beating heart pulsing blood flooding warmth grateful as the watchman's fire in the fog-sodden yard that little fire over which he used to hang warming his stiffened hands were after all amazingly one the thing surprised him even more than it surprised any one else, above all when it refused to be separated from his holy of holies, crept, danced, smiled its way through the most portentous scores, a thrilling sense of Jenny Bly, all crotchets and quavers, smiles and thrills, quaint homeliness, sudden dignity. By the time he first met Jenny he was clear of Wagner had glanced a little patronizingly at Beethoven, turned aside and enwrapped himself in the sombre splendor of Bach, right away from the world, then, harking back with a fresh vision, a sudden sense of the inevitable, had anchored himself in the solemn, wide-stretching harborage of Beethoven. It was like a return from a long-lost voyage, tearing round a world full of beauty and interest, and yet, at the same time, full of pettiness, fuss, annoyance, a homecoming beyond words. There was a sense of eternity, a harmony, which drew everything to itself, smoothing out the pattern of life, the present life, and the life to come, so crumpled that, up to this time, he had had no real idea of the meaning of it. All at once everything was immensely right, with Jenny as an essential and inevitable part of the rightness. He felt this so strongly that he never stopped to wonder if other people felt it as plainly as he did. Apart from all this, he was bound by the inarticulateness of his class. 
His Jewish blood lent him a wider and more picturesque vocabulary than most, and yet it stopped at any discussion of his feelings. We have an idea that what we call the common people are more communicative on such subjects than we are, but this is not so. They talk of their physical ailments and sensations, but they are deeply shy upon the subject of their feelings. Ben's mother would discuss the state of her insides, the deaths of her relations and friends, his own birth down to the smallest detail. But she would never have dreamt of telling her son that she loved him, desired his love, hungered for his coming, grieved at his going. Ben himself put none of his feelings for Beethoven into words, above all to his mother. She would not have understood him if he had. He said nothing of Jenny, either, save as a girl he'd met, a girl he was going to bring home to tea, but she understood that without any words. That was courting, part of the business of human nature, much like the preparation of meals. It was odd, coming to think of it, might have been ridiculous, save that ridicule was the sort of thing which could find no possible lodgment with Ben, that his determination to devote his whole musical life to Beethoven, to interpret him as no Englishman had ever done before, should have been synonymous with his sacred, heady, and yet absolute determination to marry Jenny Bly. Jenny worked in the jam factory, and there was something of the aroma of ripe fruit about her, ripe strawberries, raspberries, plums, damsons. She was plumpish and fresh, very red lips and very bright eyes, reddish-brown, the color of blackberry leaves in autumn, with hair to match. Her little figure was neat, her small hands, with their square-tipped fingers, deft and quick in their movements. There was something at once rounded and clear-cut about everything she did. A seafaring admirer used to say that she was a bit short in the beam, but a daisy fur carrion sail. And that was the idea she gave so well balanced, so trim, going off to work in her wide white apron on those rare mornings when she shook off the yellow mackintosh. Ben saw her like that for the first time crossing the lee just below the timber yard with its cranes like black notes zigzagging out over the river, which had for once discarded its fog. It was a day of bright blue sky, immense, rounded, silvery clouds, fresh and clean, with a wind which caught up the white apron and billowed it out for the sheer fun of the thing, showing trim ankles, the turn of a plump calf, such as Ben Cohen had never even thought of before, the realization of which was like wine, freshly tasted, red, fruity, running through his veins, mounting to his head. He had known that women had legs, his mother, the laundress, suffered from hers, complainingly devoted woman as she was, swollen with much standing, and them thar dratted veins, stocky legs, with loose folds of stocking. As to thinking any more of a woman's legs than of the legs of a table, the idea had never even occurred to him. But there you are. It is the unexpected that happens the sort of thing which we could never have imagined ourselves as doing, thinking, feeling. The temptations we have recognized, struggled against, are nothing. But there comes a sort of wild, whistling wind from nowhere, much the same as that wind about Jenny's skirts, white apron, and our life is like a kaleidoscope, suddenly shaken up and showing a completely fresh pattern. Who could have thought it, who, that Ben Cohen, dreamer, idealist, passionate, pure, the devotee of art, would have fallen in love with Jenny Bly's legs, or rather a pair of ankles, and a little more at that side where the wind caught her skirt, before he had so much as a glimpse of her face. Just over the bridge she stopped to speak with another girl who worked in his own counting-house. As Ben hurried up to pass them before they separated, really see her, this other girl recognized him, flung him a friendly hello, and was answered in the same fashion. 
As he moved on he heard her, was meant to hear, knew that he was meant to hear from the pitch of the voice. Clever ain't no word for it. There ain't no tune as— The end of the sentence was lost, but he knew the sort of thing, knew it by heart, had spent his time running away from it. Now, however, he was grateful, more grateful still when he met Miss Ankles again, and she herself, regarding Florrie Hines' eulogy as a sort of introduction, smiled, moved on a step, and herself tossed a hello over one shoulder. Ben's thin, olive-tinted face was flushed as he drew forward to her side with his odd stoop, his way of ducking his head and raising his eyes dark and glowing. He took Jenny's dinner basket, and she noticed his hands, large and well-shaped, with long fingers, widened at the tips. Florrie had said that he was a sheeny, but there was nothing of the Jew about him apart from his coloring, his brilliant dark eyes, unless it were a sort of inner glow, an ardor, curbed by his almost childlike shyness lack of self-confidence in everything apart from his music, that something at once finer and more cruelly persistent, vital, than is to be found in the purely Anglo-Saxon race. Though Jenny liked what she called a pretty tune, she knew nothing whatever of music, understood less, and yet almost from that first moment she understood Ben Cohen realizing him as lover and child. Understood him better, maybe, then than she did later on, losing her sureness for a while, shaken and bewildered, everything blurred by her own immensity of love, longing, a fearing that she did not understand, feeling out of it. But that was not for some time to come. In the meanwhile she was like a dear little bantam hen with one chick, while Ben himself was content to shelter under her wing until it grew upon him that, loving her as he did, loving his mother, realizing what it meant to be a mother in thinking of Jenny herself with a child, his child, in her arms, it was up to him to prove himself for their sakes, to make them proud of him and his music without the faintest idea of how proud they were already, lift the whole weight of care from their shoulders. The worst of it was, he told them nothing whatever about it. The better sort of men are given to these crab-like ways of appearing to move away from what they intend to move towards. It simply seemed as though he were forgetting them a little, then more and more, elbowing them aside to clear the way for his beloved music. He was no longer deprecating, appealing, leaning upon them. Each woman thought of him as her child, and when his love made a man of him, they realized the hurt, nothing more. He overdid it, too, as genius does overdo things, was brusque, entirely immersed in his great scheme. Sometimes he even laughed to himself over this, they don't know what I'm up to, he would declare to himself with a sense of triumph. He had never even thought of his music in the money sense before, but as his love and ambition for the two women grew upon him, he was like a child with a new toy. He would not only make a great name, he would make an immense fortune. His mind blinked, dazzled at the very thought. He moved with a new pride and also, alas, a new remoteness. His health had broken when he was about seventeen. His bent shoulders still showed that old drag upon the chest, and he was away in a sanatorium for a year. When he came back he was cured. It was young Sayre, the junior partner in the timber business, who had sent him away, and it was he who, when Ben returned, paid for lessons for him, so that he learnt to play as well as read music. From that time onward he had always stuck to the firm, working in the tally sheds, paid out of his earnings for the use of a room and a piano for practicing upon so many hours each week, completely happy and contented. 
He had never even thought of leaving the business until he realized his immense love for Jenny, and through her for his mother, the necessity of doing something big. What did sacrifice matter? What did it matter being poor, hungry, shabby? What did anything matter, just for a while? There was so little he wanted. Meals were a nuisance. His eyes were so dazzled by the brilliance of the future, set upon a far horizon, that he forgot the path of the present, still beneath his feet. If his mother had not set food before him, he would scarcely have thought of it. But all the same, he ate it, and money had to be earned by some one or other. His mother had never let him know the actual pinch of poverty. She wore that shoe upon her own foot. He had no more idea than a child of the cost of mere daily necessities, and during the last few years, between his work and hers, they had been comfortable enough. "'We can hang on for a bit,' he said, when he spoke of leaving the woodyard, and she answered, almost with triumph, that she had hung on well enough before he'd earned aught but a licking. At first she was proud of reshouldering the entire burden. It made him more entirely hers. He could not do without her. Even with Jenny he could not do without her. But she had not been a young woman when Ben was born. She was old now, and tired, with that sort of tiredness which accumulates heaps up, and which no single night's rest can ever cure. The tiredness which is ready, more than ready, for a narrower bed, eternal sleep. Hold on till after the concert? Sorry for meself if I couldn't. The concert, that was the goal. There was a public hall at Clapton where Ben had chanced on some really good music, just one night of it, and quite by chance, and this, to his mind, ennobled the Claptonites. There was the place in which to start the revolutionizing of the musical world. Besides, and here he thought himself very canny, by no means a Jew for nothing, there were fine old houses at Clapton, and where there were such houses there must be rich people. When the date was actually arranged, he practiced for the best part of the day. While he was at home he read music. He lived in a maze of music. He never thought of advertising, collecting his public. He even avoided his old friends, his patrons at the timber-yard, overcome by agonies of shyness at the very thought of so much as mentioning his concert. Quite simply, in a way he did not even attempt to explain to himself, he felt that the world of London would scent it from far off. As to paid clacks, presentation tickets, patrons, advance agents, all the booming and flattery, the jam of the powder for an English audience, he had no idea of the existence of such things. Beethoven was wonderful, and he had found out wonderful things about him. That was enough. When the angel Gabriel blew the last trump, there would be no need to invite the dead to rise. Neither was there any need to invite the really elect to his concert. Not to hear him, Ben Cohen, but to hear Beethoven as he ought to be heard. That's how he felt. During those weeks of preparation for the concert, his mother worked desperately hard to keep their home together without his earnings, while Jenny helped. At first that had been enough for her, too, to help. But later... Throughout those long evenings, when, already tired from her work at the factory, she had stood sorting, sprinkling, folding, ironing, the two women got to a state where they scarcely dared to look at each other. Just a passing glance, a hardish stare, but no looking into. If he had but once said, I can't bear you to work so hard for me, everything would have been different, the fatigue wiped out. But he didn't. He didn't even know they were working for him, working beyond the limit of an ordinary working woman's working day, hard enough, 
in all conscience. Men can't not be expected to notice things the way we do. That's what they told themselves. They did not say even this much to each other. But far, far away, out of sight, out of all actual knowledge, was the fear which neither of them would have dared to realize, a vague horror, a sort of ghost. He don't care. He's changed. And, indeed, this is how it appeared. All through that time he wore an odd look of excitement, triumph, pleasure, which lifted him away from himself. There was a sort of lilt in his very step. His eyes shone, his cheeks were flushed. When he cleared a pile of freshly ironed, starched things from the end of a table, so as to spread out a score upon it, laid them on the floor where the cat padded them over with dirty feet, and his mother railed at him, as she still did rail, on any subject apart from this of not caring, he glanced up at her with bright, amused eyes, his finger still following the black and white tangle of notes, looked at Jenny and laughed, actually laughed. "'You great oaf!' cried Mrs. Cohen, and could have killed him. Up at four o'clock next morning, re-washing, starching, ironing, she wretched with sick fatigue and something more. That sense of giddiness, of being hit on the head which had oppressed her of late. It was as though that laugh of Ben's had stuck like a bone in her chest, so sharp that she could scarcely draw breath, driven all the blood to her head. And yet it had been full of nothing but triumph, a sort of tender triumph, almost childish delight. He was going to do wonders, wonders, open a new world to them. He was so dazzled by his own work, dreams, by all he had in store for them, that he did not even see them, themselves, worn with toil, realize the meaning of it, the reason for it. In any case he would have laughed, because they had no idea how near it was to an end. That concert, it would be like nothing so much as opening a door into a new world, where they need never so much as soil a finger floating around, dressed in silk, feeding from off the finest china, sleeping upon down. Manlike, his eyes were fixed upon the future. No two women had ever been loved as they were loved. All this work, this washing and ironing, it resembled nothing more than the opening scene in an opera, a sort of prelude for the sake of contrast. They would see Oh, yes, they would see. It was like that old childish, shut your eyes and open your mouth. But they, they were bound in the close-meshed straight waistcoat of endless toil, petty anxiety. The days and hours heaped in front of them obliterated all possible view of the future. In the beginning they had been as excited as he was over the thought of the concert. He must wear a rosette, no, a flower in his buttonhole, and white kid gloves. As he moved forward upon the platform, he must bow right and left, and draw them off as he bowed. This was Jenny's idea. It was Jenny who made him practice his bows, and it was Jenny who borrowed a dress suit from a waiter friend, while it was his mother who got up the borrowed shirt to go with it stiff and shining, who polished his best boots until they looked near as near like patent. All this had been done close upon a fortnight before. Jenny was a good girl, but if she was not there to see to things, Jenny might fail with a bubble on the shirt-front. No amount of meaning well was of any use in getting up a stiff shirt as it ought to be got up. Better have it all ready, a case o' anything happenin'. That was what Mrs. Cohen said to herself, with a dull dread at the back of her mind, a feeling as though every next day were a Friday. Her face had been oddly flushed of late, with a rather fixed and glassy look about the eyes. Jenny thought of this, on her way to the concert, alone, for by some ill fate 
his nearer vision blurred in that golden maze of the future, Ben had fixed his concert for a Friday. This Friday, always a bad day, bad in itself, bad for everyone, like an east wind. Worst of all for a laundress, not so depressing as a Monday, but so hurried, so overcrowded, with all the ironing and folding, the packing of the lots, all small, into their separate newspaper parcels, the accumulated fatigue of a whole week. Some demon seemed to possess her clients that week. They had come in with a collar here, a shirt there, an odd pillow-slip, tablecloth, right over Thursday. She was working until after twelve o'clock that night, and so was Jenny, up before dawn next morning, though no one save herself knew of this. Whatever they do, they shan't not keep me from my Ben's concert. That was what she said, with the vision of motors blocking the road in front of the little hall. But she had been a laundress best part of a lifetime, before she discovered herself as the mother of a genius, and it had bit into her bone. She could not get finished, and she could not leave the work undone. Someone's got to earn a living. That was what she said, embittered by fatigue, the sweat pouring down her face, beaten to every sensibility, apart from her swollen feet, by the time that Jenny called in for her, soon after six. She had longed to go, had never even thought of not going. But by now, apart from her physical pain and weariness, she was alive to but one point, her whole being drawn out to a sort of cone with an eye at the end of it, and far, far away at the back of her brain, struggling with impenetrable mists, but one thought, if she scorched anything, she would have to replace it. When Jenny found that it was impossible to move her, she made her own way up to Clapton alone, for Ben had to be at the hall early. There were certain matters to arrange, and he would try over the piano. Her efforts with Mrs. Cohen had delayed her. She was driven desperate by that cruel malice of inanimate things. Every bus and tram was against her, whisking out of sight just as she wanted them, or blocked by slow crawling carts and lorries. There was a tight, hard pain in her heart, like toothache, round which her whole body gathered pressing, impaled upon it, a sense of desperation, and yet at the heart of this, like a nerve, the wonder if anything really mattered. Ben had promised to reserve seats for his mother and herself, but had he? Had he? Would she find the place blocked by swells with their hard stare, duchesses and such like, glistening in diamonds? In her mind's eye she saw billows of silk, slabs of black cloth and shining white shirt-fronts, hundreds and hundreds of them, and Ben bowing, bowing to them as she had taught him to do. For some time past he had been so far away, so detached, that she was haunted by the fear that if she put out a finger to touch him it might go through him, as though he were a ghost. At times she had caught him held him to her in a passion of love and longing. But even then, with his head against her heart, his lips, or some pulse or nerve, had moved in a wordless tune, the beat of time. If only he had still seemed to need her, nothing, nothing would have mattered. But he didn't. He needed no one, no one. He seemed so frail, she had made sure that he wanted looking after, but he didn't. A drunkard might have fallen down in the street, needed fetching, supporting, exhorting. A bully come home with a broken head. But it seemed as though Ben were, in reality, for all his air of appeal, sufficient to himself, moving like a steady light through the darkness, unstirred by so much as a breath of wind. Overcome by anxiety, she got out of the tram too soon. It had begun to rain, a dull, dark night, and there was a blur of misty light flooding the pavement a little way ahead. That must be the hall. 
She was afraid of overshooting the mark. Those trams had such a way of getting going just as one wanted to be out of them. But the light was nothing more than a cinema, and she had a good quarter of a mile to walk in the wet. The cruel wet! Just like it to be wet on this night of all nights. Even her optimism was gone. She kept on thinking of Mrs. Cohen, her flushed face and oddly glazed eyes, the queer stiff way in which she moved, held her head. For once she was angry with Ben. Em and his crowds, Em and his fine ladies, Em and his motor cars. After all, she did overshoot her mark. On inquiry for the hall, she was told that she had passed it and was obliged to retrace her steps. End of Story 17, Part 1